Hi, Mr Corsi here. Now I'll be going over the solutions to the 2023 paper in some detail, so this will be a fairly long video. To help you find the particular question you're interested in, I've created headings for each question. If you slide along the timeline below the video, you should see these headings and hence locate the particular solution you want to look at. So let's begin the solutions. So here's question one. It's a division of fractions. So we have 2 and 1 sixth, and we have to divide that by 8 ninths. So our first step is to change this into what I'd call a top heavy fraction. Now each one of these two would be 6 sixths. So this really contributes 12 sixths plus another 1 sixth would give us 13 sixths. 13 sixths. Usually you go 6 times 2 is 12 plus the 1 gives you 13. So 13 sixths divided by 8 ninths. Now I'm going to show you two different ways of doing this. Now the first way, which is the more conventional way, is to say, OK, we're dividing by 8 ninths. So we invert that fraction and multiply. Turn it upside down and multiply. So divide by 8 ninths is equivalent to multiplying by 9 eighths. Second method I'll show you eventually will explain why that trick works. Now we've got a multiplication of two fractions. We could do our multiplying, top two numbers, bottom two numbers, but then we'd have to see if there was any cancelling, any factors in common. And we can easily see that before we do that multiplying. 3 goes into 6 and 9. 3 goes into 6 twice and 3 goes into 9 three times. So on the top of the fraction we'll have 13 times 3 which is 39. On the bottom of the fraction 2 times the 8 which is 16. Now, how many times does 16 go into 39? Well, it goes twice, that's 32. And if we take 32 from 39, that leaves us with 7. 7 of these 16ths left over. So we've got a 16 16ths, another 16 16ths, 32 16ths, and we've got another 7 16ths left over. That's the 1 and the 1 and the 7 16ths, 2 and 7 16ths there. Now, the other way of doing this, which is less common, but it's interesting, we make up one big fraction. 13 sixths divided by 8 ninths. And remember, in fractions, you're allowed to multiply the top and the bottom of the fraction by the same thing. If you have a half, you can double top and bottom to get two quarters and multiply top and bottom by three and so on. So in this case we want to get rid of that divide by six so we'll multiply by six. Top of the fraction has been multiplied by six. We'll do the same to the bottom of the fraction. Right, that'll get rid of the six. This nine we can get rid of. The divide by nine by multiplying the bottom by nine and we'll need to multiply the top by 9. So in this case we've got rid of that 6, in this case we've got rid of that 9, and what we're left with? Well, on the top of the fraction we've got 13 times 9, and on the bottom of the fraction we've got 8 times 6. Now if we compare that with what we had up here, there's your 13 times 9, and there's your 8 times 6. So we do the cancelling again, and we get 39 over 16, which is 2 and 7 sixteenths as before. So two slightly different ways of doing it. But this way is a different way of explaining why you're allowed to turn this fraction upside down and multiply instead of dividing by 8 over 9, multiply by 9 over 8. So there we go, question 1. 2 and 7 sixteenths. So here's question 2, and we're asked to expand and simplify this algebraic expression. 
So we have an x plus 7 squared, and then we've got 6 times x squared minus 10. Now this first one, the x plus 7, various ways of doing that. Uh, one of the ways is to do first outsides, insides last. That's the way I'll do that here just now. But there is another way, and I'll show you that just in a second. And then we've got 6 lots of x squared minus 10. So let's concentrate on this first one. So the first term in each bracket, that's for the f, x times x, x squared. The outside two terms in the two brackets, that's this x and this 7. Multiply them, they're both positive, we get 7x. That's the O file. Inside 2, that's the 7 and the x. The inside two terms, again, that'll give us 7x. Finally, the L are the last two terms in each bracket. 7 times 7, that's 49. And then we've got our 6 lots of x squared minus 10. We'll come to that in a minute. And this we have to tidy up. We've got an x squared plus a 14x, 7x plus 7x, plus a 49. And we'll now deal with this. However, I'll show you the other way, which is often used. We'll make up a table x times x is x squared, x times 7 is 7x, 7 times x, 7x, they're all positive, 7 times 7 is 49. And so we've got our x squared, two lots of 7x is 14x, plus the 49. Uh, so there's our, our answer to expanding these two brackets. So that's another way of doing it, making out a wee uh, table. And this one is just getting rid of brackets, 6 lots of the x squared and 6 lots of the negative 10. So that's 6x squared and 6 times negative 10 is negative 60. Now gather like terms, we've got an x squared and another 6 of them, that's 7x squared. Our x terms, there's only one lot here, it's 14, one term here, that's 14x. Numbers, we've got two separate numbers here. We have to do 49 minus 60, that's negative 11. And that's our answer. So here we have question 3 simultaneous equations. Now I'm going to do this two different ways because there are two variables we could eliminate the x's or eliminate the y's and the two different methods that you might have tried to do with this question. So let's try them both ways. So the first one is to eliminate x's from these equations and if we look at the x terms, we've got two x's in the first equation and we've got five lots of x in the second equation. And remember we eliminate, uh, say, the x terms by multiplying the equations by a number, a suitable number, and trying to get this x term the same. Now, the smallest number that 2 and 5 both go into is 10. So by multiplying the first 1 by 5, we'd end up with a 10x here. And by multiplying the second equation by 2, we'd also end up with a 10x here. And that's our aim, to get the same coefficient in the x term, same number of x's. So everything gets multiplied by 5 in the first equation. That 5 lots of 2x is 10x. 5 lots of 3y is 15y. And 5 lots of 8 is 40. Second equation, everything's doubled. So 2 lots of 5x is 10x. 2 lots of 2y is 4y. 2 lots of negative 2 is negative 4. And in this case, to get rid of x, and therefore get an equation in y only, which we can then solve, we would subtract these two equations. So 10x away from 10x is 0, 
4y from 15y is 11y. And if we take away negative 4 from 40, it's like adding 4 to 40. So we get 44. Let's now divide both sides by 11. 11 into 44 is 4. So we get y equals 4. Now, to get the value of x, we choose one of these equations. Let's choose the first one. And we'll put what we've discovered, that y is 4, we'll use that knowledge in the first equation. So we're going to put y equals 4 into that first equation and see what we get. So what does that give us? Well, it still gives us two lots of x. We don't know what x is yet. Three lots of y would be three fours. Now let's take away 12 from both sides. And let's divide both sides by 2. So there we have our value for x and our value for y. Now it's often very useful you can find mistakes by trying to check your answers in the other equation, the one you didn't use here. So we'll try that. Let's put x equals negative 2 and y equals 4 into this expression, 5x plus 2y. Let's hope we get a negative 2 out of it. So 5x plus 2y now becomes 5 lots of negative 2, that's negative 10. 2 lots of y would be 2 lots of 4, which is 8. And negative 10 plus 8 does indeed give us negative 2. So we've checked it. So there's our solution. Now the other way of doing that, of course, is you might not have uh, chosen to eliminate x, you might have chosen to eliminate y. So here's an alternative method that you may have used. So let's go through that. So we look at the y term. There's three of them, there's two of them. The smallest number that 3 and 2 both go into is 6. Let's double the 3y to get 6y. Let's multiply the 2y by 3 to also get 6y. So there's our instructions, double everything in the first equation. 4x plus 6y equals 16. Multiply everything in the second equation by 3. 3 fives are 15. 3 twos are 6. And 3 times negative 2 gives us negative 6. Now again, these are both the same sign, so we would subtract. If they were opposite or different signs, we would add the two equations. But in this case, we subtract. 4x take away 15x is negative 11x. 6y away from 6y is 0. When we take away negative 6 from 16, it's like adding 6 to 16. And we'll get 22. And we divide both sides by negative 11. 22 over negative 11 is negative 2. That ties in with what we got before. So in this case, we'll choose one of the equations and replace x by negative 2. Let's take the second equation this time. Either equation would have done. So what do we get? We get 5 lots of negative 2, which is negative 10. 2y, we still don't know what y is, equals negative 2. So this time let's add 10 to both sides. So 2y, 10 added to negative 2 would be 8. And so therefore divide both sides by 2 and we'll get y equals 4. And these are the two values we got in the first place. Now the check, let's put x equals negative 2 and y equals 4 in the equation we didn't use. So we put them, these values, into 2x plus 3y and let's hope we get 8 from that. So 2 lots of negative 2 is negative 4. 3 lots of 4 is 12. 
and negative 4 plus 12 does give us 8. So that's been checked. So whichever way you used, you should have got the solution being x equals negative 2 and y equals 4. So here's question 4, part A. We're asked to find the, the values of A and B. And this is a quadratic graph, a parabola. We're told it's of the form y equals x plus a all squared plus b. So before we answer this, let's have a look at an animation. So here we have an animation of a graph y equals x plus a all squared plus b, which is basically the graph in the question. And I'm able to change the value of b and change the value of a. Initially, the way this is set up, I've got b being value 0 and a as having value 0. x plus 0 is just x, so that's x squared plus 0, just x squared. So this is y equals x squared. You can check that that works. 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4. Negative 1 squared is 1, negative 2 squared is 4. This is showing the graph y equals x squared. So let's first of all start changing the value of b. So we're going to look at y equals x squared plus b. Let's increase the value of b. Watch the graph. Let's increase to 1, to 2, to 3, to 4. And I think you realise that the heights of the graph are moving up parallel to the y-axis. So for, an in for instance, when b is 2, all the heights have gone up to where it used to be 0, the height is now 2, where it used to be 1, it's now 3, and where it used to be 4, it's now a way up at 6. So all the heights of the points on this graph have moved 2 units up parallel to the y-axis. So that's the effect of b, and, and similarly if there we're subtracting, for instance, 2 at the end, y, uh, y equals x squared minus 2, all the heights of the points in the graph down two units, down three units, four units. So that's the effect of altering the value of b, up, down, parallel to the y-axis. Let's alter the value of a. Let's move a up to a value of 1. Now this possibly is counterintuitive, where we add 1 to x, the graph is moved to the left, not to the right. Adding 2, adding 3, adding 4. So that when we add positive numbers, the graph has moved to the left. When we add negative numbers or subtract values from x, the graph moves to the right. There's x minus 4. So let's recap. Numbers at the end, up and down parallel to the y-axis. Numbers added to x, to the left, parallel to the x-axis. Numbers subtracted from x, to the right, um, parallel to the y-axis. So let's now return to the question we were doing. So we can see here in this graph that from the y equals x squared position, this graph has been moved 3 to the right and 2 up. Now, 3 to the right would imply a was negative 3. 2 up would imply b was positive 2. So I think we can now answer uh, part 1, where the value of a will be negative 3. And the value of b will be 2. So a is negative 3, the graph has moved 3 to the right. And b is 2, the graph has moved up 2. Now, let's tackle part b. And that tells us that this point p is 0c. 
So x is 0, we're really trying to find the height of the graph there, find the value of c. So what do we know so far? Well, we actually know what the formula for that graph is. It's x minus 3 all squared plus 2. And this question is asked, this part of the question is asking us really what's the value of y when x is 0. So let's put that in. When x equals 0, we can find the value of y by plugging in 0 as the value for x in that formula. So 0 minus 3 is negative 3, which we then have to square. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Add 2 to that and we get 11. So the height of this graph is 11. So that's the point 0, 11. Now, we're asked for the value of c, so that means c equals 11. And there's our answer. So here we have question 5. We're asked to determine the nature of the roots of this quadratic function. Now the roots of a function like this would be the values of x that make 4x squared plus 6x minus 1 equal to 0. So let's write that down. 4x squared plus 6x minus 1 equals 0. And we're trying to find the values of x uh, that solve this equation. As you know it's a quadratic equation and uh, solving quadratic equations, let's look at the formula for that. ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. And we know the solutions to this are given by the quadratic formula, minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now that's on your formula sheet. So this would appear to give us two values for x, either negative b plus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, or another value would be minus b minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So it would appear on the face of it that we do get two values of x, or do we? That very much depends on the value of b squared minus 4ac. So, for instance, if b squared minus 4ac is a positive number, then square root of a positive number again is a positive number. would be adding something and subtracting something. We would get two different distinct values. So we would have two real distinct roots. Another alternative would be if b squared minus 4ac was 0, and square root of 0 is 0. So if we're adding 0 and subtracting 0, these two values are not different. We'd say there were two equal roots in that case. There's really just one value for the root. So these would be equal roots. Again, it would be a real number. And then the alternative, the, the third alternative, is to have b squared minus 4ac being less than 0. Now, if we have the square root of a negative number, that's not a real number. So in that case, we would have no real roots. Now, just to remind you that this expression, b squared minus 4ac, is called the discriminant because it discriminates between all these it discriminates between these all these different alternatives so b squared minus 4ac is called the discriminant so that's the theory and we'd really have to investigate in this case what the value of the discriminant is before we can distinguish the nature of the roots, which one of these three situations is occurring in this case. So let's look at the discriminant. That's your b squared minus 4ac. Now b squared, b is the coefficient of x, so that would be 6 squared, minus 4 times a 
a is the coefficient of x squared, in this case it's 4, 4ac, c is the constant at the end, in this case it's negative 1. So that's our discriminant, 6 squared is 36, if we're taking away a negative value, that's adding, 4 times 4 times 1 would be 16. So it's the case that the discriminant is greater than zero. And so we're looking at two real distinct roots. So we'd say that precisely since the discriminant is greater than zero, then there are two real and distinct roots. That's opposed to two equal roots, which is this case, when b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0. Remember, we're adding 0, subtracting 0. We only get one value in effect. We call that two equal roots. So in this case, when the discriminant's greater than 0, we're adding a number and subtracting a number would therefore have two different, two distinct values, both real numbers. So two real and distinct roots in this case. So here's question six. We're given a triangle A, B, C with various measurements given. In particular, we're given that the cosine of angle C is a fifth. And we're asked to calculate one of the sides AB. Now it's this value, cosine of C is a fifth, that gives us the clue that probably we're going to be using the cosine rule. Now you're given a formula sheet for the exam and the cosine rule stated in two different forms. But you'll notice there's little a's and there's the large a's. Now we know the large a's are the angles, but the small lowercase letters involve sides. Now if we look at angle A and we go to the opposite side, that's little a. Angle B, the side opposite, is little b. And angle C, the side opposite, is little c. So in this case we're asked to find the length of AB. So we would use this first form of the cosine rule because that's got a length of a side on its own on the left hand side. This one has an angle on the left hand side. We use the first one to find lengths of sides, the second one, one the second form to find the size of angles. So We'd use this first form, that's a squared is b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cosine of a. But unfortunately little a is the wrong side. We're trying to find little c. So instead of that version, we'd use a version that has a little c instead of a. And we follow the pattern of this formula where this small a, this angle, large a, small c, large c, so we know that's going to be cos c. Let's look at the form of this. a squared is b squared plus c squared. That's the square of the other two sides, the ones not involving A. So these terms would be the ones not involving C. That would be the A squared and B squared. This product here, 2 times B times C, is 2 times the product of these two sides. So in this case it would be twice A times B. So we're following the same pattern among the sides and angles of this first formula to create the formula that we're going to need in this case. So this 
side C or AB squared will be A squared plus B squared minus 2 times A times B times the value of the cosine of C. Remember in the first paper you have no calculators. So little a squared, little a is 6, little b squared, that's 5 squared. And then it's minus 2 times a times b, 6 times 5, times the cosine of c. Now we do know the cosine of c, we're given the value of that, it's 1 fifth. 6 squared is 36, 5 squared is 25. Now in this case, 5 and 1 fifth, 1 fifth of 5 is just 1, these cancel out if you like, uh, so it's times 1, makes no difference to 2 times 6, which is 12. 12 times 1 is just 12. So 36 plus 25 is 61, and we take away 12 from 61, we get 49. Now that gives us c squared. So to find c, we take the square root. Square root of 49 is 7. Now we're asked to find ab. Well, that's what we've found. So the length ab is 7. And what are the units? All the units are in metres. So AB is 7 metres. So here we have question 7. And it's to do with a business recording a sample of their employees. And they're looking at how long they've worked for the firm in years. That's plotted along the T axis, the time axis, and their salary, current salary in pounds, that's their pay, it's the P axis. So each dot represents an employee, and we've drawn here the line of best fit. We're asked to find the equation of this line of best fit. Now let's look at this. There are two points, this one, and this one that actually lie upon the line. Now what's our strategy here? Well, P, T axis is slightly unfamiliar. What you've learnt is to deal with the X, Y axis. So what we're going to do is to deal with this as a y and x axis and then we're going to find the equation of the line in x and y. And then we're going to translate it back into an equation in t and p. So that's the strategy. Now there are basically two ways of finding an equation like this, and they both involve finding the gradient. So let's first of all look at the two points on the line. So two points on the line, and we've got them circled in red, are, well this one is 520,000, so that employee work, has been working for five years and they're earning £20,000. And the second point that we've got on the line is a, for an employee that's been working 25 years and is earning 50000 So there's the coordinates of two points on the line. Now both methods of finding the equation of a line like this involve finding its gradient. So let's first of all find its gradient. So the gradient of the line, and we usually use the letter M for that, and it's the Y difference, that's the two Y coordinates and their difference, over the X 
difference. It's the difference of their x coordinates. So in this case, y difference, would, let's start with the second one. And remember, when you're finding these differences, the one you start with is the one you start with on the top and the bottom for the difference. So the y difference, let's start with 50,000 and subtract 20,000. There's the difference of the two y coordinates. And the x difference, remember starting with this point, 25 for the x coordinate, minus 5 for the y coordinate. Now, 50,000 minus 20,000 is 30,000. 5 from 25 is 20. And if we divide out by 10, top and bottom, we're left with 3,000 divided by 2, which is 1,500. So that's the value of m, our gradient. And the first method that we're going to use, we're going to use the formula y minus b equals m times x minus a. And a and b, a, b, are the coordinates of any point that's on the line. So putting in values that we know, let's use this point for our A and our B. So Y minus B would be Y minus 20,000 equals gradient we've worked out is 1,500 x minus a is the x coordinate of this point that we're using and that's 5. So that's the equation of the line. It's not in the simplest form. Let's first of all uh, get rid of the brackets on the right hand side. So 1,500 times x and then it'll be minus 5 lots of 1,500. So that's 7,500. Now let's now add 20,000 to both sides. So that'll disappear. We'll still be left with 1,500x. And if we're adding what did we say we were adding? 20,000 to both sides. So if we add 20,000 to 7,500, that'll be 12,500. In effect, we're taking away 7,500 from 20,000. So that's the equation in terms of y and x. So the required equation Remember we said we're at this stage, you find the equation in x and y, translate it back to t and p. So the required equation is, well, instead of y, that's this axis, it's p. So that would be p equals 1,500, and then instead of x, that's t, capital T plus 12,500. So there's our required equation. Now that's the first method. And there is a second method. We'll go through that just now before we go on to part B. So in this case we use the simpler looking equation y equals mx plus c. Now we'll come to that c in a wee minute but basically the gradient we know which is 1500 
and the only thing we don't know is the C at the end. However, because this is the equation of the line, Y and X are the coordinates of any point that lies on the line. So again, let's use this 5, 20,000. Um, so it's 20,000 for a Y coordinate. And that's 1,500x. No, not x. Times whatever x is. And x is the x coordinate, so that's 5. So there's 1,500 times the x coordinate, 5, which goes with a y coordinate of 20,000 because we're using this point here on the line plus C. And that's enough for us to find what C is. So remember 5 lots of 1,500, that was 7,500. And we'll take that from both sides. So we'll have 20,000 minus 7,500 giving us the value for C. And that, as before, is 12,500. So C is equal to 12,500. So the equation is Y equals 1,500X plus 12,500. I.e. the same as we had before. P equals 1,500D plus 12,500. That's when we translate it back into our P, our T and P axes. So there's the equation that we're after. Now let's have a look at part B. And it says, use your equation from part A, that's the one we've just derived, to estimate the salary, that's the P value, of an employee who's worked for the business for eight years. That's the T value. So we want T equals eight. When T equals eight, we're required to now find the P value. And we'll use the formula. So to find P, it tells us we do 1,500 times T plus 12,500. So it's 1,500 times T is 8, and then we add 12,500. Now, 8 times 1,500 is uh, 5, 8, 40, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12,000 plus 12,500. So that gives us 24,500. So let's make sure we've answered this correctly. Estimate the salary of an employee who has worked in the business for eight years. So estimated salary is 24,500. So here we have question 8, where we're asked to express 12 divided by root 15 with a rational denominator, giving our answer in the simplest form. Now, the denominator is this square root of 15. And in essence, it means we have to get rid of a square root on the bottom of this fraction. Now, a little comment first. We know that if we take a number, for instance, 8, and multiply it by 1, it doesn't change that number. 121 times 1 is still 121. So if we take this fraction and multiply it by 1, then it'll be exactly the same as it was. It'll have the same value. Now that's the trick here, in that we multiply it by 1, but rewriting 1 as the square root of 15 divided by the square root of 15. 
So all we've done is take 12 over root 15 and multiply it by 1 in this new form. Now, rules for multiplying fractions, we multiply the top two numbers, we multiply the bottom two numbers. After all, a half of a half is a quarter. You can see that we've done that there. 1 times 1 is 1, 2 times 2 is 4. So 12 times root 15 in the top of this fraction, and root 15 times root 15 on the bottom of this fraction. Now, this is why this method achieves our aim of getting rid of the square root at the bottom of the fraction. Root 15 times root 15 is 15. After all, that's all that the square root is. Square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. Square root of 9, that's 3, times square root of 9, that's 3. 3 these are 9. Uh, square root of any number n times the square root of the number n is just n. Taking the square root and squaring it will get rid of the square root. So that's what's happening on the bottom of this fraction. Now, it asks us to write this in its simplest form, and that means we have to cancel any factors on the top that are in common with factors at the bottom. And we can see that 3 goes into both 12 and 15. If you like, we can write that out as 3 times 4 times root 15. And on the bottom of the fraction, it's 3 times 5. And there's the common factor of 3 being revealed. We can divide the top of this fraction by 3 and the bottom of this fraction by 3. So we end up with 4 times root 15 over 5. And there's no more simplification that we can do. Uh, 15 is 3 times 5, but these are both prime numbers. We can't do anything with that. It's not like, uh, for instance, square root of 18, where we can factor 18 into 9 times 2, and we know the square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of 2 is the square root of 2. That would be a simplification of root 18. That can't work for root 15, because none of the factors of 15 are perfect square numbers, like this 9, where we can find an exact square root being 3. So root 15 can't be simplified. There's no more factors in the 4 and the 5 that we can cancel out. That is 12 over root 15 expressed with a rational denominator. We've got rid of the square root there. And we've given our answer in the simplest form. So here we have question 9. And a magazine company has asked some of its readers what their ages are. They've done a sample survey and there's the data here. There's 10 ages given. And we're asked to calculate the median and the interquartile range. Now the median's one type of average. It's a good one if you've got a group of people and you want the quick average of their height. You put the tallest one on the right, shortest on the left, put them in order of height and choose the middle one. Um, now, if there is a middle one, there might be two middle ones, but I suppose you take the mid midway between the two middle heights, add them up and divide by two, the mean of the two middle heights. So the median, arrange them all in order, increasing order, and choose the middle one, or <coughs> take the mean of the middle two. So let's start with the 30s. We've got 33, 38, 36, 35, 31 is the smallest one. So let's do that down here. So 31. Next one, 33. Now, it would be wise to stroke these out as you're going so you don't get confused. The next one would be 36. No, 35. Then 36. So 35. And then 36. We've got one more in the 30s, that's 38. Now we're on to the 40s. 
Got a 47, 41, 42, 41. So a couple of 41s. Let's stroke them out. There's a 42. So that's been used up. 47 and finally a 55. So 47 and then 55. So there's the ages in order, increasing order. And we have to choose the middle one now. There's 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We can divide them into two groups. Now, the median would be halfway between these two. So halfway between 38 and 41. Now, that's the mean that would do. We'd be adding up the two numbers and dividing by 2. So we'd have 79 divided by 2, which is 39 and a half. So 39.5 halfway between these two. So this is the median. Thirty-nine point five. So that's the answer to the first part of part A. I suppose we should spell it out. The median equals thirty-nine point five. Now, what about the interquartile range? Well. To find that, we would have to find the median of the lower half, that's these five, and then the median of the upper half. Now, the middle value of these five is actually this 35. That's what we call the lower quartile, or Q1. The median is actually Q2. And the upper quartile we'd have to take these five and choose the middle one, which would be 42. And that's called the upper quartile. So of these three quartiles, Q1, Q2, Q3, lower quartile, the middle quartile, if you like, is called the median, and that's Q2, and Q3 is the upper quartile. Quar quarter, one, two, three, divides it into four. Uh, groups, these quartiles. So median 39.5, lower quartiles Q1, upper quartiles Q3. Now this gives us a, an example of the spread of these data, whether they're clustered around the middle or whether they're far spread out. And it's the difference between Q1 and Q3. So if we take the large one and subtract the small one, this is what we're calling the interquartile range. So the interquartile range and that's Q3 minus Q1, the difference between the upper quartile and the lower quartile. So that's the difference between 42 and 35. Well, that's 7. OK. So that's Q3 minus Q1. Now, let's move on to the second part. And the second part of this describes another company, it's a newspaper company, a similar survey going on. In this case, their median was 41 years, as opposed to this 39.5. And then their interquartile range was nine years. Ours was seven years. I'll put the measurement there. So it's a larger spread and a slightly greater average age. So let's make two valid comments about these ages. Let's put that over here. So let's use one, uh, one statement using the medians. And we'll say that uh, 
the average age of newspaper readers is greater than that of the magazine readers. Um, median forty one compared to median thirty nine point five, i.e. that's one point five years greater. And then a second statement we can make is using the interquartile range. And we notice that that interquartile range for the newspaper was nine years as opposed to seven years. So the spread of readers ages is greater for the newspaper than for the magazine readers ages. So that's uh, interquartile range of nine years compared to seven years. Two years greater in the spread. That's the spread around that median. So there's two statements, one using the median and one using the interquartile range. So here's question 10. We've got Alan buying a whole load of paving slabs to make a path. There's the diagram. And each slab is, consists of part of a circle. There's a bit of a slice taken out of the, each circle. So there's what the slab looks like and we're asked to calculate after having been given some of the measurements there we're asked to calculate the width of the paving slab and that's from this chord AB remember a chord just straight line joining two parts two points on the circumference of a circle this chord from this chord to the far edge of that circle. So let's look at a larger diagram of that and I think it would be useful to draw a line diameter through the centre perpendicular to AB. So we'll slice that slab horizontally where well, that's a right angle. And this width, you notice, is made up of two parts. It's made up of this section, which in actual fact is a radius because it's going from the centre out to a point in the circumference. So that's a radius. And then this other part from here to here. Now let's name this. Let's call this M, this point where it meets chord AB and let's call this point N. So we've got this part which is MC and this part which is a radius. So the width that we're after would be the length MC from where that line, that part of a diameter, if we drew it right up to the edge, it's a whole diameter, where 
that meets the chord at point M to the centre and then add on the radius from the centre out to the point N. Now, that's not a problem. CN. We know the radius. There's the radius. Centre to a point on the circumference. It's 50 centimetres long. So the only problem now is what's the length of MC? And if we look carefully at that diagram, we see we've got a right angle triangle where we know that side's 50. We're trying to find this side. What about this side from A to M? Do we know the length of it? Well, yes, we do, because that diameter that we've drawn at right angles to that chord AB is an axis of symmetry. In other words, it chops the line AB into two equal parts. So M is the midpoint of AB. And since AB is 60 centimetres long, half of that is 30 centimetres long. So this side AM is 30. And we know how to find the third side in a right angle triangle. Now this side we're trying to find is not the hypotenuse. And we use Pythagoras' theorem, but because it's not the hypotenuse, it will be the difference of the squares of the other two sides. So it'll be the hypotenuse squared minus that other side, AM squared. So we'll have 50 squared minus 30 squared. And 50 squared, well, 5 fives are 25 with a couple of zeros. And three threes are nine with a couple of zeros. Nine hundred. If we take nine hundred away from that, we'll get sixteen hundred. And remember to get rid of squares, we take square roots. So a square root of both sides of this equation. On the left hand side we'll get MC without the square. And on this side, we'll get the square root of 1600. Now, we know the square root of 16 is 4. Square root of 100. See, that's 16 times 100. And the square root of 100 is 10. So it'll be 4 times 10, 40. So that's the length of MC, 40 centimetres. So adding these two up, we get 90 centimetres. So that's the width, this 40 plus the radius of 50. So here we have question 11. We're given that the sine of 30 is 0 0.5 and we have to state the value of sine 330 degrees. Now we're in paper 1, we're not allowed to use a calculator, otherwise we'd just plug this into our calculator to find out what the answer was. So there's basically two methods that I'm going to show you how to do this. The first one involves the quadrant diagram or the CAST diagram or the butterfly diagram. There's all sorts of different names for it. And the second way is by means of the sine graph. So let's do the first method, the quadrant diagram. And to introduce that, we're going to show a little animation of the unit circle. And here it is. It's a circle with radius 1 centred on the origin. And you'll notice that there's a radius line along the x-axis. Now what we can do is rotate that radius anti-clockwise to a position where it's 30 degrees from the x-axis. Now you'll notice that the end point of that radius has a y-coordinate of 0 0.5. That's shown by the red line on the diagram. And provided that circle has a radius of 1, the end point of that rotating radius will always read off the sine of the angle that the 
radius has rotated, in this case 30 degrees. So this little diagram is showing you that the sine of 30 is 0 0.5. That's shown by the red line. Let's continue rotating that line. So there we go. And the sine eventually of the sine of 90 we can see in this diagram is equal to 1. So let's continue the rotation beyond 90 degrees. And the sine is now decreasing. The red line is now at 0 0.5, similar to what we had at sine of 30. And you'll notice we're 30 degrees short of a rotation of 180 degrees. That would be back to the x-axis. So we've now rotated at 150 degrees and we're getting the same value as the sine of 30. So let's continue this rotation. So now the line's rotated 180 degrees and you'll notice that the y-coordinate of the point at the end of the rotating radius is now zero. The line's lying on the x-axis. So the sine of 180 is zero. Let's continue. And now we've got the appearance of 0 0.5 yet again, but this time it's negative. The point is lying below the x-axis, so the y-coordinate of that point is now negative. And we're 30 degrees past 180, so we're now at 210 degrees. So the sine of 210 degrees is negative 0 0.5. Continuing again, and we now have a line rotating 270 degrees. The sine of 270 degrees is negative 1. The y-coordinate of that point is now negative 1. Let's continue. So we're continuing that rotation and look, here's the 0 0.5 appearing again. It's below the x-axis, so it's negative. And surprise, surprise, the 30 degrees appears again. We're 30 degrees short of a complete turn of 360. So this diagram's telling us the sine of 330 degrees is negative 0 0.5. And finally, let's continue. So just to complete a complete turn of 360, we've now got the y-coordinate of that point, 0. So the sine of 360 degrees is 0. Now let's summarise what we've found in the famous butterfly diagram. So let's get our x-axis and our y-axis and our 30 degree diagram. And we have symmetrical positions for that 30 degrees. There we go. So this one gives us our 30 degrees, and we know that the sine of 30 degrees is 0 0.5. And from our little animation, we know that this angle is 180 minus 30, which is 150. And by the symmetry of that, this we can tell that the sine of 150 is 0 0.5 also. Well, round at this position, this is 180 plus 30. And that gives us 210. And we can tell that the sine of 210, the y-coordinate of that point, which will be negative 0 0.5. And finally, round here, this is 360 minus 30. That's 330 degrees. And this tells us that the y-coordinate of the point there is negative 0 0.5 by the symmetry of that diagram. So that's the butterfly diagram. So in answer to the question, the sine of 330 degrees is negative 0 0.5 because we know that the sine of 30 is positive 0 0.5. Now there is another way, and that's 
to look at the sine graph. So let's look at an animation of that, just to connect that to the unit circle that we've just been looking at. So on the left we have our rotating radius diagram in a unit circle. On the right we've got our x and y axis where the sine graph is going to appear. And what I'm going to do is transfer the heights, that's the y coordinates of the point at the end of that radius, onto the graph at the right as we rotate the radius. So let's start doing that. So there we've reached 30 degrees, 0 0.5, and we keep going. And the sine eventually of 90 is 1. You'll see the familiar sine graph appearing down to the 180 minus 30. That's 150 degrees at 0 0.5. And the sine eventually of 180 is 0. We continue on. 180 plus the 30 gives you 210 degrees is negative 0 0.5. We continue on. The sine of 270 degrees is negative 1. Then 360 minus 30, that's a 330 degrees. Sine of that is z negative 0 0.5. Continue on, the sine of 360 ends up as 0. And there's our familiar sine graph. So that then leads us to the other method you could have solved this question. Knowing that the sine of 30 is 0 0.5, and we're interested in, therefore, points on this graph that are at a height of 0 0.5. It's along this line here. Also, points that are at a height of negative 0 0.5. So, sine of 30 is 0 0.5. The sine of 150, that's by symmetry, 30 degrees away from 180, is also 0 0.5. Then there's a symmetry in this area of the graph where you do 180 plus 30 to give us the 210 degrees, but this time the graph's below the x axis. So sine of 210 degrees would be negative 0 0.5. And also 360 minus 30 degrees, that's 330 degrees. And the sine of 330 degrees is negative 0 0.5. So you can use the symmetry of the graph for this. Question tells you sine of 30 is 0 0.5. So by symmetry, the sine of 330 would be negative 0 0.5. So here's question 12. It's an indices question. Now looking at this, we're asked to simplify it and to give our answer with a positive power. And you notice the powers here, there's a negative one. And these two down here are both positive. Now, there's two results that we're going to use from the laws of indices. One of them is about negative indices. And x to the negative n would be 1 over x to the positive n. Sometimes it's good thinking, well, this is on the top of a fraction. If you've got a negative power, it can jump down to the bottom of the fraction and the index becomes positive. The other result we're going to use is that if you're multiplying two powers of the same number, in this case x, then you'd add the powers. So let's have a look at what we're faced with. Now certainly the bottom of this fraction, uh, this result here, comes into operation and we can just add these powers. So we get c to the power 7. And if we look at this negative index, 
And we look at this result here, we can interpret this as saying, well, if we've got C with a negative power on the top, this fella can jump down to the bottom of the fraction, provided this negative power becomes a positive power. So the 5 just sits there watching everything happening, and this C to the negative 2 appears down here as C to the positive 2, and it'll be multiplying by multiplied by the C to the power 7. Now that's easy enough to complete, because again we bring in this second law of indices here where we're adding the two powers because we're multiplying. So 7 plus 2 gives us 9. So we get c to the power 9. And there's a simplified version of this where the power is positive. So here's question 13. We're shown part of the graph of y equals cos x plus a degrees plus b. That's shown in the diagram here. We're asked to state the value of a and state the value of b. So let's first of all do a little exploration on an animation of this graph. So here we have the graph y equals cos brackets x plus a plus b, just as in the question. And I've set a to be 0 and b to be 0. In other words, we've got the cosine of x plus 0 plus 0. So that's just the cosine of x. And you see the typical cosine graph. It starts off at 1, cosine of 0 is 1, and it decreases down to 0 when x is 90, cos 90 is 0, and continues to decrease. Cosine of 180 is negative 1, starts increasing, cosine of 270 is 0, back up to 1 when the angle's 360 degrees. So that's a typical cosine graph. Now we'll do some experiments on this and alter the slider. So I'm going to move it to the right and add positive numbers to the angle x. So have a look at the graph and see what happens. I think you'll agree that that graph is moving to the left. Let's go back to zero. So when I add positive numbers to the angle x, the graph moves to the left. But how much does it move? Well, let's move it to 30 degrees. And you'll notice where it used to cross at 90, the cosine of 90 is 0, it's now moved 30 degrees to the left. So the number you're adding here tells you the number of degrees that the graph moves to the left. So if I continue and move this up to 60, then we can see where it used to cross the x-axis at 90, it's now moved 60 degrees to the left, and it crosses at 30. And continuing up to 90, you can see it's now crossing at 0. So that's fine. And you can imagine what's going to happen when I make these values negative. It will do the opposite of what I was doing there, and it should move the graph to the right. So let's move the slider to the left. And there you can see the cosine graph moving to the right. And again, the number indicates how far it's moved. So in the case of moving this to negative 30, x plus negative 30, that's like x minus 30. So I'm subtracting 30 from the value of x. And the graph has moved 30 degrees to the right, where it crossed at 90. It's now moved 30 degrees to the right, and it crosses at 120. So if I add values, it moves to the left. If I subtract values, 
it moves to the right. So that's the first experiment. Now let's move on to this plus B at the end. Again, I'll move the slider to the right. And this time it moves up. So if I'm adding positive values of B, it moves up. Now let's see how that uh, affects the distance it's moved. Adding 1, you'll notice it's now maximum value of 2. It used to have a maximum value of 1. So the whole graph has moved up by one unit when I add 1 at the end. And presumably if I subtract 1, if I make that be negative, I'm subtracting 1, the whole graph has gone down one unit. If I subtract 2, it's gone down two units. And if I add 2, it's gone up Two units. So just to recap, adding positive numbers to the angle moves the graph to the left. Subtracting numbers from the angle moves the graph to the right. Adding positive numbers at the end moves the graph up. Subtracting numbers at the end, or adding negative numbers, moves the graph down. Now, let's go back to the question. So here's the graph in the question. And we have to decide for value of A how far to the right or the left the normal cosine graph has moved. Now remember, the normal cosine graph appears as a maximum at 1 and then moves down towards 0 at 90. And if you look at this graph, the maximum is now here. And that would appear, remember there's three divisions here, 30, 60, 90. So it would appear to have moved to the right by 30 degrees. So we're saying therefore that A is negative 30. Remember, adding 30 moved it to the left. Subtracting 30 moved it to the right. Opposite maybe of what you imagine it should be. But A is therefore negative 30. And the other value, the value at the end, remember how far up or down has the graph moved? Well it came up to a maximum of 1 normally. It's now come up to a maximum of 2. So we've added one unit, so B will be 1. And that's the two values that we're asked for. So it moves 30 degrees to the right, giving you a negative 30 for A, and it's moved up one unit, giving you B being 1. Well, here's question 14, and we've got a in equation to solve. So the first thing we should be doing is getting rid of these fractions. Now there's a divide by 3, there's a divide by 5, so if we multiply both sides by 15 then we should manage to get rid of these. So let's try that. Let's do 15 times the left hand side and that will still be greater than 15 times the right hand side. Multiply both sides of an inequation by a positive number, the inequality still holds. So both terms get multiplied by 15. Now this first term, 3 goes into 15 five times. So there's a cancelling that goes on there and we'll be left with 5 times the top of this fraction which is x plus 1. If you're not sure about that, let's just spell that out. We divide this by 3 and we divide this by 3. We're left with 5 lots of x plus 1 in the top 
and a 1 on the bottom. That gives us 5 lots of x plus 1. Minus 15 times 2 is 30. So there's your left-hand side. Greater than, and here's the second cancellation that goes on, if you like. We'll divide 5 into 15 is 3. 5 into 5 goes 1. Top of that fraction, 3 lots of 3x is 9x. 3 times 3x is 9x over 1. So we're just left with 9x. Now let's get rid of the brackets on the left here by multiplying both terms by 5. We'll get 5x plus 5 minus 30 greater than 9x. And we can simplify the 5 minus 30, that'll give us negative 25. That's greater than 9x. Now, let's now add 25 to both sides. That'll keep the inequality still the same. So we'll get 5x greater than 9x plus 25. And let's take away 9x from both sides. We're allowed to do that. The inequality still remains the same. So we'll get negative 4x on the left being greater than 25. Now, this last step, we need to get rid of this negative 4 by dividing both sides by negative 4. Now, when we do that, when we, let's move over to here, when we divide by a negative number in an inequality, then that does not hold. If you consider 2 being less than 4, and if we divide by negative 1, negative 2 less than negative 4, that's not true. Remember in the number line, negative 2 is greater than negative 4. So this has to be turned around. So we've got a mistake there. We have to turn that round this expression will now be less than 25 over negative 4. So the negative 4s cancel and we're left with x being less than positive divided by negative is negative 25 over 4. And that's a perfectly healthy answer. You could, I suppose, write it as for 6s, 24, 1 left over negative six and a quarter. Perfectly okay writing it as negative 25 over four. So final answer, x is less than negative 25 over four. Well, that's Mr. Corsi signing out and hope you enjoyed the video. <laughs>